ओम ज्ञान चिरंधस ज्ञानंजन शलाकय चक्षुर्मील तस्म श्री गुरव नम I chose to speak on this verse particularly for the line in it or half line to be more accurate madarte tekt jivitaha they're all ready to forsake their lives for my sake says duryodhana referring to the many heroes the many warriors who are lined up there at kurukshetra which is quite remarkable <laughs> if we think of the common phrase as dear as life and the uh, advice uh of chanakya for instance that you can sacrifice one person to save your to save a family you can sacrifice a family to save a village you can sacrifice a village to save a state and to save yourself you can sacrifice everything <laughs> that's understood in relation to the body so life is very dear but all the warriors lined up at kurukshetra they're ready to die for duryodhana's sake as he sees it it is technically although um the kshatriyas they fight with the understanding as krishna would try to explain or he would explain to arjuna but arjuna didn't get the point for some time that kshatriyas fight because that's what they do potters make pots barbers shave people and weavers do weaving and kshatriyas fight it's their dharma that's what they're supposed to do and by doing so swagadwaram apavritam the doors of heaven are open to them sukhina kshatriya parita labhante yudhami drisham therefore the kshatriyas are very happy to get an opportunity to fight because it gives them the chance for glory in this world and the next so uh, giving up one's life for the sake of duryodhana is not very glorious <laughs> although duryodhana thinks it is because he thinks he's glorious but there are many persons who will give up their life for the sake of god especially in the uh, christian religion there's the idea of a martyr the idea that well christ died on the cross so if we die for the sake of Jesus being just as Jesus was killed unfairly by nasty people in a very severe way so if someone can die for the sake of Jesus then they're guaranteed to go to heaven as they say and in uh, Islam also to at the present time it's become prominent in the last generation or so it's nothing new but it's become prominent at the, it wasn't very prominent for quite some time now it's become quite prominent the idea of jihad and by dying in the battle for to establish Islam then you go directly to paradise guaranteed and uh we may wonder why there's a rash of suicide bombing you may think that's a very rash thing to do but those who do it they do so on the conviction that they are pre- pleasing allah by doing so and when allah is pleased then yasmin tushte jagat to well at least i'll be i'll get my job done which is i'll go to heaven and enjoy all the endless supply of virgins up there boys and girls yeah so uh in islam it's quite prominent in christianity it's not very prominent at the present time we don't have anyone preaching much about that at the present time which is good because 
much of the history of Christianity has been one of, uh, well, in one word, killing and giving up one's own life. A lot of violence and crusades, march off to the Holy Land, and if you make it there, you can fight with the infidels and earn your place in heaven. They even had a children's crusade once, so children from all over Europe marched off, but eventually they got sold into slavery. They didn't reach the Holy Land as to fight. So, uh, <coughs> it definitely takes a lot of conviction to do that. Uh, that in the conviction that by doing so, this is, this is the best possible way to serve Jesus or Allah. And uh, people aspire for that. They think it's a very glorious death to, to die for God. So it's certainly very, uh, takes a lot of bravery. It's a very, in one sense you could say it's heroic. Uh, certainly the people who do that, they are seen by their compatriots, those who approve of it, they see it as heroic. Although it is debatable how much heroism, actual heroism, is uh, involved in blowing yourself up and blowing up a bunch of other people who are just uh, praying in a mosque, for instance, Muslims killing Muslims, the, the religion of peace, they call it. And, uh, <clears throat> or in a bus stop or somewhere like this. And the people, they're just in standing in a bus line and looking on their iPod and all of a sudden they attain a situation in which they'll never send any text messages ever again. I mean, what a... What a great sacrifice to kill yourself and you can never use an iPod ever again. Phew. Real sacrifice. So, uh, people may do that also. They may have some motivation to go down in history, be remembered as a great hero. Uh, many people, uh, they want to have their name remembered in future. Let me do something great so that my name will be remembered in future. They don't think very seriously about what will happen to them in future, but they simply want that their name will be remembered. As Srila Prabhupada noted, the statue of Ashutosh Mukherjee in Calcutta. He's a famous name. I can't remember what for. <laughs> But he's, I'm sh probably none of you have ever heard of, have you ever heard of Ashutosh Mukherjee? So he was famous for something at the time and his statue's still there in Calcutta. And as Srila Prabhupada notes, once a year they celebrate his birthday and they clean up his statue from all the pigeon droppings that's covering it with a municipal brush. That means the same one that's used for cleaning the streets. And this is the glory of Ashu, Ashutosh Mukherjee. He did something to be remembered. So it's not such a good idea to act, to go down in history as a hero. So, okay folks, now it's time to die for Krishna. Okay, put down your bead bags and pick up a gun. We're going to have a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Are we? Shall we have a, let, let's have a, Jihad for Krishna. Is that a good way for spreading Krishna consciousness? Convince people that Krishna consciousness is the best religion by blowing up a few people who we don't agree with. I know a few people who like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is not actually a campaign for enlisting soldiers in the onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. <laughs> But listen, you hear that? Marching as to war. Not marching to war, marching as to war. There's a difference. As to war means as if we were going to war. It doesn't mean actually to war. So it's not part of our tradition, actually, that we have this idea that we'll 
go and fight. Of course, Arjuna, he was asked to fight for Krishna. He was asked by Krishna. But that's, especially not in our Gauriya line. Krishna comes, and in his, not all his avatars, but many of his avatars, he is engaged in, uh, Ete chang shakala pungsa krishna stu bhagavan swayam indrari vyakalam no kam midayanti yuge yuge. He comes to, uh, in his various avatars, to deliver the world from those who are disturbing Indra. And he often does that by vinashayata dushkritam, by killing the demons. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in this age, considering that if we have to kill the demons, there'll be no one left, he delivers us from our demoniac mentality. So physical killing is not recommended. If you want to get into that, then uh, you could come back in Ram Leela. Krishna Leela, he doesn't... Krishna has his army, but mostly he just does all the killing himself. Just like when he was fighting with Jirasa. He'd tell everyone, okay, you all stay inside, I'll go out, and he just finishes them all off himself. So there is scope for that, but not in this Kali Yuga. So uh, this is not recommended to become a martyr, even though we do have a war, it's the war against Maya. And where does that begin? On the street with our machine guns? Jump out? You have to be careful. Maybe the, uh, N, what is it? NSA, the National Security Administration, they don't have it. Well, we don't know. They might have it here also. Maybe they're spying on us and listening to everything. And they'll send a, a bunch of... Uh, SS guys to to they're spying on us. I I doubt it. I mean, why should why should they bother? I mean, they're really desperate if they're spying on us. <laughs> Even if we wanted to, we couldn't. We're so we're so disorganized. We we couldn't pull off any guerrilla. I mean, we can pull off a rathiatra. <laughs> we haven't pulled it off yet. <laughs> So, we have a war. The war against Maya it begins in here. The demons in the heart, if we can kill them, that will be very nice. And as far as killing is concerned, killing the demoniac mentality by spreading the holy names and chanting and distributing Srila Prabhupada's books and like this. But still, uh, we can consider how, how far are we prepared to sacrifice for Krishna? Would we be prepared to die for Krishna? There are instances we find in the Bhagavatam, not even dying for Krishna, dying for the demigods. The Didichi, twice, once he got his that's not exactly in the Bhagavatam, but it comes in one commentary in the sixth canto, one Muni called Dadichi. So the Ashwini Kumaras, they wanted to get Brahma Vidya, spiritual knowledge. But Indra, he didn't want them because they're physicians, they're Shudras, they're not fit for this Brahma Vidya. So the Ashwini Kumaras approached Dadichi and asked them, asked him to tell them. Uh, but Indra warned him, if you do that, if you teach him, I'll cut off your head with my thunderbolt. So the Ashwini Kumaras, because they're physicians, uh, they said, okay, what we'll do, we'll cut off your head and put a horse's head on. You teach us with the Brahma Vidya through the horse's head. And then when Indra comes and cuts your head off, we'll put your original head off. So he did that. So he was a higher griever also, horse head. Then another time that's related in uh, some detail, that in the Bhagavatam, again in the sixth canto, that uh, Dadhichi, he agreed to give his body 
because his bones had the constitution that could be made into a weapon that would kill Vritrasura. So he gave up his life for the sake of the demigods. Mm. But our, our, yeah, our war is against Maya, but it may be. We don't know. Anything can happen anytime. Would we be prepared to die for Krishna? There are many instances in the history of India, which is not taught in modern schools in India, because they want to maintain the peace between Hindus and Muslims. But there, there were many instances of, uh, not only Muslims, but also the Christianity spread in Goa uh, under St. Francis Xavier, who would torture people and do all things like that to make them into Christians. So he's a saint. Uh, so many people, they just refuse. They, they say, no, I'm, I'm not going to uh, become a Christian or a Muslim. And the test is that to prove that you're no longer a Hindu, you have to eat beef. And many people would just refuse. And then they'd die. They'd die. Choose beef or die. If you choose beef, that shows you're fully converted. And it's going on even today, actually. This kind of thing. Christian conversion going on. Of course, not by, they can't kill people, but they, uh, if they want to get the benefits of being a Christian, the financial benefits, uh, and other benefits, mm -hmm. education and all this kind of thing, then they have to do things like spitting on pictures of demigods and ripping them up and things like that. And eating beef, of course. So, what would, what would we do? Beef or die? Eat beef or die? What should we do? Difficult question, huh? Or to, do, do, will you blaspheme Krishna? Will you, oh, it's horrible to think of it. But we could be put in a situation, you don't know. There must have been many people in India who never thought that they'd ever be put in such a situation, but they were. And then they, on the spot, they had to choose. They didn't have time to have a philosophical parley about it. But they had to choose. So, what would we do? Srila Prabhupada said, I would rather die than eat meat. <laughs> But when uh, Hari Swami at that time, he was ordered by Srila Prabhupada to go to Russia and preach. And he was making various excuses, one after the other. One of them said, well, there's nothing to eat there except meat. And Srila Prabhupada said, then eat meat and preach. You have to preach there. If, if it requires to eat meat, you can do that also. So when they got there, they, they found there was, there were some other things apart from meat. Not, there were. I went there in 1986 and there were some things. There were potatoes and uh, cabbages in some supply and there was rice, this very hard Vietnamese rice. And there's lots of butter because the European Union provided it at a very cheap rate to keep the price up in Western Europe. So they, they sold it off. They wouldn't sell it to the people in Western Europe. But anyway, that's another issue. So, uh, you could, theoretically we could eat meat, but many people, they just chose to die. And in Bangladesh in 1971, East Pakistan at that time, there are many cases. They said, eat beef, and that means you become a Muslim. And uh, what would you do? Well, uh, you could take it maybe and just, after they've gone, just chant Hare Krishna again. <laughs> That's one possibility. But uh, the, the system was so rigid that Srila Prabhupada explains that in a purport in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, that if a Muslim was simply to sprinkle water from his water pot in a Hindu, then that Hindu would be considered converted and he had no way to come back to Islam. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, no no way to come back to Hinduism. So, uh, that question came up with Subuddhi Rai, because, anyway, it's quite a long story, but the, when he, he was converted to a Muslim in this way, 
then he asked the Bhattacharyas, they're the ones who, uh, nowadays not, but in those days Bhattacharyas, they would, you would have to consult them, that I've done this sin, what should I do to get expiated, and this and that. So Subuddhi Rai, he asked the Bhattacharyas, how can I get free from this sin? And he was told, you drink boiling ghee, which would kill you. That was the idea. It's the only way to get free from this. And then he asked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, oh, it's great. Now you're rejected from society. You can leave home and go to Vrindavan. So he did. He went there and went on with Krishna consciousness. So, uh, what should we do in such a situation? We, could we do such a horrible thing as eating beef, blaspheming Krishna, to save our life so that we can go on serving. What should we do? I, you may think, well, this is not very relevant. You know, why are we discussing this? But you never know. It could happen at any time. Now life in Britain is fairly peaceful. Not very peaceful, but fairly peaceful. More or less, there's a situation of law and order, more or less. But things can deteriorate very quickly. You never know what will happen. Lebanon used to be considered like a paradise. Not now. <laughs> Syria just recently, all this fighting began. And they, they, Libya was a peaceful country until someone decided that it needs a change of leader. Uh, so it can happen here. We shouldn't think, well... We're so civilized here in Britain and this kind of thing can't happen. Things can change. That's the nature of Maya. We always think that everything is very nice and peaceful, and but things can change very quickly. Either in a small situation, it can be some riots or something like that, in a, in a localized situation, or the whole country can become chaotic very quickly. So we could be faced with situ such a situation. But apart from that, the question of would we die in such a... Would we be, ex would we be prepared to die? Uh, there is the ongoing, at every moment, situation of sacrificing. At every moment we have to sacrifice Krishna. We're, we're asked to sacrifice our life for Krishna. Of course, the proper understanding is that we don't really sacrifice anything. The idea that I, I could enjoy myself, but instead I'll serve Krishna. So I'm sacrificing my life for Krishna. Well, that's one way of thinking, and from one perspective it might be true, but then... In, uh, maybe a better outlook is that anyway, uh, this life is full of suffering, so let me just surrender to Krishna. I haven't got anything. I don't owe anything. I don't own anything. I can't enjoy anything. So uh, Krishna is very mercifully saving me from this misconception. But the idea that we have to sacrifice, it, it, it is a sacrifice for us as long as we are thinking that this world is something, some place for me to enjoy, then it seems to us like a sacrifice. That We could have eaten meat, drunk wine, had illicit sex and gambled and so many things. But we may have a desire for some of those activities. But we discipline us. No, I must not because I have to serve Krishna. And even apart from such extreme things as eating meat, then we may think that, well, would be nice to sleep till at least eight o'clock on a Sunday morning. Everyone else is sleeping, but no, I have to get up for Mongolarji. So that's a kind of sacrifice, that we have our own desire, but we know what Krishna wants of us, so we do what Krishna wants of us. So like this, that's not a... Maybe that's not a sacrifice on the level of giving up our life, which is very dramatic. But uh, it's this attitude that my life is meant for Krishna. 
So in that way we can we are supposed to give our life for Krishna. Actually it belongs to Krishna. If we but we Krishna has given us the independence to choose to offer our life to him or to go on in illusion thinking that I can live separately from Krishna or maybe I can give 50% to Krishna, 50% to myself or some other. We can work out some deal here. What, what's the minimum I have to do to go back to Godhead? It's just, sometimes devotees come as if they're bargaining. Is, can I still go back to Godhead if I don't do this and I don't do that? And, like some bargaining here. What's the best deal I can get? But instead of thinking, what's the least I can do and still get all the benefits? The real attitude is to think that uh, I have to do more and more and I, I'm, I can never do enough. Not that let me, let me have some opportunity to enjoy myself separately from Krishna and still get Krishna's full mercy. So, uh, we desire to live for Krishna. Uh, the highest understanding is that we live for Krishna. That means mind, body, words. Such a person is called Jivan Mukta. The idea that I will die and give up my life and then I will be liberated and I'll go to Krishna. But the uh, understanding we're given is that uh, in this world, who that person who identifies himself as a servant of Krishna and dedicates all his, his mind, his words, his thoughts, in all situations, in the service of Krishna. So that person's already liberated. You don't have to die to get liberated. And even if we die, if we're still in, in the consciousness of enjoying separately from Krishna, or, or maybe I think I'll die for Krishna, I'll get something from Krishna for doing so. It's not... But it's this attitude that I am meant for Krishna's service. That is liberation from material entanglement. And even if we think I'll die for Krishna and then uh, I'll get a good write-up on Dandavats, how I'm a martyr and people will praise me, then that dying may not have the effect because our fruitive mentality is, has not died. So we carry that to our, if we have that at the time of death, then we'll carry that to the next life. What is that verse? Shriram Yadavapnoti what is it? Shriram Yadavapnoti Yach Chap Yut Kramatishvaraha Grihit Vaitani Sanyati Vaya Gandha Nivashayat. Just like the air carries aromas. So we are carried from one place to another, but we carry it, our consciousness goes with us. So we may have this idea, die for Krishna, let everyone see, but that mentality will, will cause us to be born again because we have a defective mentality. Whereas someone who, without making a big show, dedicates themselves, mind, body and words in the service of Krishna, then uh, they don't have to die to be liberated, they're already liberated. So, there, there may be some circumstances that we have to, we may be called to, to give our life. We have to think. If we are in such a situation, then we'll have to think. What, what is the advice? If someone asks us, for that, what should we do in such a situation? All situations are different. We have to see. We have to consider, does Krishna want this. Can I, if I can, by dying I can better serve Krishna, then let it be done. If not, not. It's not a question of this heroicism or stoicism, but what does Krishna want? Can I best serve Krishna in this way or not? 
That should that is always the consideration of a devotee. He's not out to make a dramatic show. Uh, so we desire to live and die as a servant of Krishna. And and Srila Prabhupada he said that for uh for a devotee to die, it's not such a major thing. And anyway, if we consider we've had so many deaths and so many births. So although death is certainly the most dramatic moment in our life, uh, and the most telling moment, because yang yang vapismaran bhavam tyajyante kalevaram tam tamay vaiti kauntaya sadatad bhava bhavita. Everything uh, that we think of at the time of death, what we think of, that will determine our next life. But for a devotee, Srila Prabhupada said, there's, there's, you, you live serving Krishna and then you just go to another place to serve Krishna, that's all. There's, there's no difference. It's not that there's any big change. You just change the situation and go on serving Krishna. So we live to die and die to live. <laughs> Live to die means uh, we should always remember that death is ahead. We can't enjoy this world. And we have to be tested. We, have, we should always remember that death is ahead. So we should live in a manner that we're ready to die. We're told that we should always live this life as if this is our last day. What would you do if this was your last day? You wouldn't Space out when chanting your rounds. Well, it'd be like you can go on the Rathiatra and then having a Rathiatra here today. But if if we had that information that it is our la- today is our last day, then probably we'd be a lot more intense in our chanting, isn't it? So the idea is there that we should live every day as if it's our last day, but. Well, it might be, and certainly one of these days is going to be our last day. And although we always think that, well, let me see, I, now I'm such and such an age, and I'd say if I live to 70, then okay, make some calculation, like that. Which is also practical, and that's also there in Vedic culture. With the idea that one's a brahmachari, then a grihasta, then vanaprastha, maybe sannyasi, all these things. But at the same time, we realize that there's no guarantee and any time we could pass away. And devotees also. It's not that devotees, they're exempt from this. There are many devotees who die sudden deaths from accidents or whatever. So it's good advice to remember. Smaran nityam anityatvam. Always remember that everything is temporary. We should always be ready to die. It can happen to us at any moment. We say that, and everyone says, yes, yes, yes. But that urgency, we don't feel it. Sometimes we need to wake up and Krishna sends some, some, some dangerous situation. And then we become more attentive. Oh, that was very dangerous. I could have died. Then we become very attentive in our chanting for a few days. And then again the complacency comes. So it's good to remember that we are living to prepare for that time of death. And what is that time of death that a devotee dies to live? A devotee dies to live and living tries to spread the holy name around. We die... Not thinking that, well, it's all over, but life will go on. We life in the service of Krishna. So, on the one hand, we have the idea that we could die at any moment. On the other hand, there is a process of sadhana. There is, there is expected there'll be gradual development. That's also, um, taken into account. Ado shadha tata sadhu sangha. Then bhajana kriya tato narta nivriti syat tato nishta ruchis tata tato bhavya buddhansati sadhakana. 
Tata Saktis Tatobhava. Yeah, so these are the stages. There is a gradual progress from initial faith to associating with devotees to engaging in activities of devotional service to becoming free from the uh, bad things in the heart. Then some uh, taste and steadiness and attachment to Krishna. Then uh, ecstatic feelings for Krishna. And then prema. Sadha kana mayang premna pradur bhave bhavet kramaha. So, it's described, this is the development of prem, comes from this gradual process of sadhana, from its uh, advent, pradur bhav, and it, it develops krama, step by step. So, both considerations are there. We have to die, it may come any time, we should understand the urgency at the same time, we have to uh, be realistic about our present situation. Not that we... Well, theoretically we could, but for most people it takes some time to become purified. Theoretically we could be overnight or just in an instant, free from all material desires. But ceto darpana marjanam, marjanam means cleaning, and generally cleaning means especially when there's lots of dirt. It takes some time to clean up. It's not just an abracadabra process and it's all of a sudden everything's clean. So the heart has to be cleansed. So, who's ready to die? You're ready to die. It can happen any time. <laughs> Once uh, one of our sannyas, it was actually Kirtananda Swami in long time, in his better days. So he was. He asked all the devotees there in New Vrindavan that who is ready to die. There's a large group of devotees, several hundred devotees. A few put their hands up, tentatively, cautiously. Most of them. And he asked them, and most of them said, no, no, not ready. Ready to die means we should be confident of our Krishna consciousness. Confident that we're ready to go back to Godhead. If we have material desires, then we have to come back again. So most devotees didn't raise their hand. So he asked so many devotees, and then he said, I'm not ready. There's so many services I have to perform. In Śrīla Prabhupāda's service. So that's another consideration. Of course, we may have so many desires to do so many services, but man proposes and God disposes, both for the materialist and for the devotee. We may, decide, we may think, I want to do so many things, build so many temples, write so many books, make so many disciples, chant so many rounds, do so many parikramas, but... Krishna, he can take us away at any time. Krishna's desire is more powerful than ours. So better that we desire... Of course, it's good to desire to do many things in Krishna's service, but the most important thing of all is that we ourselves should be come free from all material desires. And that way we should die. Let our material desires die. And in this way, we can uh, live in Krishna consciousness and be ready to go back to Godhead. That requires some sacrifice. It may not be physically dying, but definitely some sacrifice. In, in one sense, it's not a sacrifice, because what do we have anyway? We are... But because we're attached to so many things in this material world, it seems to us like a sacrifice to work hard for Krishna, to put aside all those ambitions we may have had to be a successful technocrat or whatever, just put that all aside and do whatever is required in Krishna's service. Of course, it may be that uh, in many cases we... we 
we may not even recommend if someone says, okay, I, now I'm going to sacrifice everything for Krishna. So forget my house and wife and children and and uh, career and all these things, but such a devotee may be advised and that, no, you continue in the situation you're in and serve Krishna from that situation. So even though he may have the enthusiasm or the inspiration that now I'm, I'm just going to sacrifice everything for Krishna, but we may be recommended to do so within our present situation. Sthane Stita. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he recommended this, that in whatever situation we're in, we, we sacrifice, give up our material desires and attachments, but uh, we may discharge our Krishna consciousness while also discharging the various material duties that we have. It, the, the, the real spirit of sacrifice may not be so much to physically give up as to mentally give up so many attachments. Uh, it is required to get out of the comfort zone, as it's called. Just In material life, we're always trying to make some situation where we're physically and mentally comfortable. Everything's nice. Let, let me make everything nice and peaceful in my life, and then I can serve Krishna very nicely. And we spend our whole life trying to make some peaceful and comfortable situation. And it becomes mundane, practically. So, in that way we can sacrifice. That, instead of always trying to find out what's the most comfortable situation, we just get on and do our service. Not that we deliberately try to find discomfort, also. That, uh, for instance, we may think, let me get some useless old uncomfortable car. But then if we're, uh, we'll drive here and there for preaching, but the car is always breaking down and we're always tired because we're all, the car is always bumping all the time. And So we may, we may get some good car so that we... Course, I don't think you feel it so much in this country, but definitely driving in India is very, can be very tiring because the roads are not very even. And a lot of the cars, are, the suspension is uh, not so much, it's meant to hold the car together rather than to hold the passengers together. That, that's as far as it goes. Just a, so it can be very tiring. So it, maybe it's a good idea to get a better vehicle so when you arrive at a program you don't have to be carried in. <laughs> it's not a joke, he knows. Yeah. So, sacrifice is there. Sacrifice has to be there in Krishna. It's not an easy-going life. But at the same time, we don't unnecessarily, for the sake of bravado, we don't just accept difficulties just to show what a what a tough Vaishnav I am. Grit your teeth and go out in the snow in your underwear. <laughs> you should have warm clothes in the snow. So that we don't, so the body doesn't get sick and we can serve Krishna uh, via this body. From one perspective, many of the devotees who have come to Krishna consciousness, they have sacrificed a lot. The, many devotees, if they, uh, if they hadn't joined the movement full time, they could have quite uh, possibly become successful businessmen, bankers, professors, or whatever. So, and many of the devotees who are grihastas, if they weren't devotees, they, their career could have gone much better 
They could have concentrated more on their career, but instead they're doing service in the temple so they don't get all the promotions they're expected to get. So that could be considered a sacrifice. Of course, the devotee himself doesn't see it like that because he thinks that, anyway, what is all this? Getting a big job, career, and so... Of course, there is some idea that if you have a successful career and then you preach, people will be more inclined to become devotees and then they say, oh, you can be materially successful and also be a devotee. But the thing is that those who are materially successful, you have to work so hard that you don't have... You have to put in such long hours and concentrate on it so much that you don't really have that much time for devotional practices anyway. So maybe you might, in, by being materially successful and also being a devotee, we might inspire many people to be materially successful and be a devotee at some uh, mediocre kind of level because they're so much absorbed in their career. So... I don't recommend that. I know others do, but I don't. I, I just do your job. Yavat Artha Prayojanam, Srila Prabhupada said. You get money as much as you need and not more. Don't, don't get in the rat race and try and, and then you get in that consciousness. I gotta get ahead and show I'm better than others and all. It's just very low, high position and low consciousness. But a devotee aspires for whatever position Krishna gives me, maybe a low position, but high consciousness. Think of Krishna. Be happy thinking of Krishna. And, uh, there's no happiness in this rat race. And it really is a rat race because it's uh, a lot of envy and backbiting and politics and all this kind of thing. You know all about it. Yeah. And even in ISKCON, there are some... <laughs> i got to be a GBC, i got to be a guru... Uh, okay, I'll let my son join, but he should have a good position. It's petty, petty consciousness. Our desire is to be gopi bhartu padakamalaya dasu dasana dasa. Be the servant of the servant of the servant of the maintainer of the gopis. So this idea, I'll have a big position. To, to desire to have a big position is antithetical to... It's not Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness means chuna the peace To think oneself lower than a straw. So, it's, it's not easy for us if we can sacrifice that or give up that mentality of wanting to be bigger than anyone else then we can actually advance in Krishna consciousness. So who is a hero? This In the fourth canto, Srila Prabhupada writes that the real hero, he says that there have been so many heroes in history, and he gave some recent examples. Napoleon, great hero, some others he gave also. But he said that the real hero is one who can control his senses. We may become a great controller of men by becoming the uh, ruler of a country, but to control the senses is a greater achievement and more difficult. So in this way, this is heroism. It's, it's a personal heroism which others might not, not notice. If we stand up and say, yes, I'll die for Krishna. And then someone shoots us, so he may, oh, he died for Krishna. So th that may be noticed, but it's, we all have the opportunities for heroism. The, the temptation is there, maya calling, and we just say no. And no one knows that, we don't have to announce to everyone. Yes, I did have a desire to go in the ice cream shop and uh, eat half of the items in it. But I resisted it. I'm a hero. We don't have to tell others. Just walk past the ice cream shop. And actually, if we don't, if we make the practice that, or the resolve that I'm only going to take Krishna Prasadam and I'm not going to cheat by walking into the ice cream shop and mentally offering everything and then buying one. But if we make this sankalpa, 
this determiner, I'll only take Krishna prasadam, that which is prepared by devotees, offered to Krishna, then there won't be any heroism in walking past the ice cream shop because we won't even think of walking into it unless we're going to sell some books. We're not tempted. So, apart from heroism, actually wars are one... Heroism has to be there, but there has to be strategy also. So, instead of having a bunch of foolish heroes who are ready to jump up in front of the machine gun fire, ours is not to reason why, ours is but to do and die, that poem was written by Tennyson, I think, about the charge of the light brigade. They were told, charge! And they, they were there were guns in front of them and, both, and they were in a valley and on both sides of the hill there were guns at the side. So they all died, pretty much. So that was considered great heroism. But it was, it was a stupid order on the path of their commander which just wiped out their whole, their whole forces. So wars may be, heroism is there but you also have to have some good strategy. So it's not all about heroism. There are also rules and regulations that we have to follow, which will help us to be free from, that will help us to be free from the desire for sense gratification. That will help us to become Krishna conscious. So, foolish heroism, better than foolish heroism, is to have some sober guidance. Heroism may or may not be there. It's not our ambition to show everyone what a great devotee I am. This is another kind of foolishness. But if we're actually endeavoring to serve Krishna, then there may be uh, situations may arise in which we uh, are called for various sacrifices. And actually all the time. All the time, just like the, the pujari has to rise early, all the devotees have to rise early, and pujaris, especially at festivals, they have to work very hard, and although others may take some extra rest, they they may not have the opportunity. Jamashtami, the, all the devotees stay up till past midnight. Pujaris have to be up for Mangalati. Others might not, but pujaris have to, so it's a sacrifice. No one sees, Krishna sees them. <laughs> And to do, to go on steadily year after year sacrificing for Krishna is, that is, that is living in Krishna consciousness. And our material life is dead or dying. So that is uh, more laudable than, far more laudable than blowing ourselves up for the name, in the names of, in the name of Allah or even in the name of Krishna. So this, uh, every, this hero, every devotee is a hero, whether they're doing some spectacular activities. We don't need it. too many spectacular performers. We need a lot of dedicated devotees. You need pujaris and cooks and devotees who are ready to go out steadily, day by day, distributing books. This is required. Not theatricals, okay, but we need some... Uh, steady heroes, un, unsung heroes. Or not that we're looking for uh, praise like this. Uh, there are devotees who have died for Krishna in the short course of this Krishna conscious movement. Maybe some of you have seen that book called Salted Bread. It's a very touching story of a, a young man in Russia during Soviet rule, who was a devotee, who was arrested for being a devotee and put in a horrible prison. And prisons are not nice, but some are worse than others. So in his prison in Siberia, and at any time he could have just said, okay, I quit. I, any time he could have said, all right, I'm giving up this Krishna consciousness and let me out. And they would have let him out but he'd have had to go on TV and said, I'm finished with this Krishna consciousness, it's all bogus, but he, he refused to do that. And so he had to suffer tremendously in prison. 
And there was an international campaign to get him out. And eventually, after a few years of being in that inhuman situation, and uh, he wouldn't, he, he would only take the, the, he wouldn't take all their food because they gave meat, so he wouldn't take it. So he was getting very, very sick. And eventually his release orders came under international pressure and the release order came just after he died. So he preferred to die rather than uh, give up Krishna consciousness and he would have had to... He could have gone on national TV and and said this Krishna consciousness is all rubbish, I'm giving it up and then quietly he could have gone on with his Krishna consciousness afterwards but he didn't want to do that kind of anti-preaching. So that's heroic. I don't know how many of us could go through with that. He he, pure, devotee. Hmm? pure devotee. Yeah. There was a case of uh, one Hladini Devi Dasi. She was shot dead in Liberia. But actually, I, this is a... I mean, I... I could get in trouble for this. some people. Some devotees might be upset by my saying this, but it's, but it was unnecessary. Actually, she she should have got out of that situation, and those who were her authority should have told her she had the opportunity to get her. There's no reason to stay in such a dangerous situation where she couldn't help anyone, and she died, and there was nothing. There was no gain to the Krishna conscious movement for her dying in such a situation. So that. Die, all right. She's glorious, no doubt, but we, sh- we should be somewhat intelligent also. If there's a very serious situation and in which we, we might suffer loss of life uh, with no particular gain for the Krishna consciousness movement, then better get out and go on serving Krishna elsewhere. So uh, heroic heroism is wanted. But heroics is not wanted. There's a difference. Because Shriramadyam Khalu Dharma Sadhanam. This is often quoted, or used to be a generation or so ago in India, when many people in India still used to know Shastras. Nowadays, if you say a few verses, people become very impressed, like in Coventry the other night, this Indian consulate staff. They became very impressed because I quoted a few verses. But it used to be that many people... So, so this was... It's a well-known saying. It's not actually from Shastra. It's from a Kalidas play. But the point is there that the we require the body to perform sadhana. This human life, we have the opportunity to perform sadhana. Therefore, the body should... The implicit understanding in this is that we should maintain the body, not for the sake of enjoying the body, but because we require this body for performing sadhana. Uh, as far as giving up our body for Krishna, well, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, we have the, well, one example is Haridash Thakur. Uh, that's actually Chaitanya Bhagavad where he was, because he refused to give up chanting Hare Krishna, he was ordered to be whipped in 21 marketplaces, which is equivalent to being killed, because you were not supposed to survive. But he did survive. But he was ready to die, rather than giving up the Hare Krishna mantra. And actually for him, he couldn't have given up, because Khanda Khanda... Hoy deho jai jodi pran tabu nacharyaho se harina. He said that even if my body is broken into little pieces and I die in this way, I still can't give up the holy name. So even if he tried to give up chanting, he couldn't give it up anyway. So he honestly told the, the magistrate, I can't give up chanting. He said, okay, we'll beat you then. But he didn't, he was supposed to die, but he didn't. But he was ready for whatever treatment came to him. Uh, there's the, uh, another Haridas who 
looked at a woman. That's all. And he was supposed to be a renunciant. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, to teach his devotees, he rejected Haridas, Chota Haridas. So after one year of Haridas not being allowed to come in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's company, for what even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's associates said was a minor offense, Haridas went to Triveni, which is the confluence of the Ganga, Saraswati and Yamuna, and drowned himself. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was told about that, uh, he smiled and said, Swak, uh, what is that? Swakarama, mm, Bhukpuman. Swakarma fal Bhukpuman. Everyone gets the results of their activities. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is very strict in this regard. So, uh, later Chota Haridas came in a spiritual body and sang for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So again, he got the association of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But then when Sanatan Goswami, he decided to kill himself, give up his body. Because Sanatan Goswami, he'd come to Puri and he wasn't allowed to enter the Jagannath temple. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would come to see him every day and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would embrace Sanatana Goswami. But Sanatana Goswami, he was very unhappy that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would embrace him. What do you think of that? You think he should be happy, isn't it? That he's embracing him? But because Sanatana Goswami had contracted an infection whereby he had weeping sores, that means that Apart from the fact that his whole body was burning with this rash, his whole body was oozing pus. And so he thought, oh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's embracing me. It's a great offense for me that I'm contaminating his body. Please, if you'd like to take photos, you can take them. I'll pose for you if you like, but not now. If you like, you can sit and listen better. Ah... Uh, so, Sanatana Goswami, without telling anyone, he decided that the Rathiyatra festival is upcoming and I'll go under the wheels of the cart and in this way I'll leave my body because I'm just, I'm committing offenses, I can't serve Krishna properly, like this. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu knows every, what's in everyone's heart because he's in everyone's heart. So, he told Sanatan. Very important instruction. Deho tage Krishna na pai pai e bhajane. Krishna prapte rupai kon nahi bhakti bine. He said that one cannot get Krishna simply by giving up one's body. By, by suicide or any way of giving up the body. The way to get Krishna is via bhakti. So we may think that oh, the, the, the martyr, they die for Jesus or they die in the jihad and then they ought, by doing that you're guaranteed to go to heaven. But not in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. If you have the idea, let me die for Krishna, I'll go under the wheel of the Jagannath cart or I'll, uh, I'll do a suicide bombing and, and claim, blow up all these people and say, you know, it's like, you know, interfaith. The Christians are doing it, the Muslims, why shouldn't we do it too? So, we have the same rights as everyone else, so we'll also do it. And we blew some people up to spread love of Krishna. It's a little difficult to justify that philosophically, but you never know. I, I hope no one gets the idea to do that, because really we, we do not want any such thing at all. But even if someone got the idea, let me heroic, let me go to Syria and where those people are fighting, I'll stand in the middle and say, Om Shanti, 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 and tell them, you should all surrender to Krishna. And then, in the meantime, uh, someone just shoots you in the head. And I say, oh, he died for Krishna. Must be going to Krishna. But not according to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This idea that you become a martyr, you don't get automatic liberation. You, we have to be Krishna conscious and we have to execute Krishna consciousness in the way 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells us, and he doesn't tell us to have these false heroics. We cannot get Krishna simply by dying. That's another consideration, is that we often hear the devotee leaves this world and say he's gone back to Godhead. But it's not it's not necessarily that everyone who's been chanting Hare Krishna goes back to Godhead in this life. We always say, oh, he's gone back to Godhead. But it, it may be more wishful thinking on our part. We have to, it may take several lifetimes. As you know, when someone dies, they say, materialistic, pious people say, oh, he's gone to heaven. But there's no guarantee he's gone to heaven. And even if someone's a devotee, a yeah, nice devotee, this and that, but... If we have any material desires, we have to come back to this world. So this idea that everyone dies and they all go back to Godhead, not necessarily. It's not necessarily true. So, suicide is not recommended. There's civil suicide. It's said that taking sannyas is civil suicide because in... in uh, Vedic or Vaishnava culture, when a man takes sannyas, his wife is treated like a widow. Her husband has died to the world. But many devotees have the experience, Grihastas also, that when they take up Krishna consciousness, it's a kind of civil suicide because they've, they've, their friends don't want to be their friends anymore and their parents also may not like them. And, uh, so you, you, you be, be, be become as if dead to many people who you thought they liked you. But they don't like you like that. So, would we die for Krishna? Yes, we should all die for Krishna. We should live for Krishna. We should die for Krishna. If someone uh, gave us the opportunity or, or brought a gun to our head and said, either you blaspheme Krishna or we shoot you dead, what should we do? We have to consider in all circumstances, either living or dying, whatever we do, we have to consider how can Krishna best be served. If by dying I can better serve Krishna, all right. If by living I can better serve Krishna, all right. What does Krishna want? What, what do I think Krishna wants me to do in this circumstance? But this martyrdom is not our aim and object. Bhajan kara, shadan kara, marti jan lehoi. Everything will be tested at the time of death anyway. That will come. So better uh, live in Krishna consciousness now. And whenever Krishna calls us, we should be ready to go. And don't join Duryodhana's army. Don't die for, don't die for Duryodhana. Die for Krishna. That's my synopsis of this. Any questions, please? Yeah. British government sent the troops to Syria. Is the soldiers simply can get to heaven or not? The British troops in Syria, if they send their troops, there are probably some over there already. Quite likely they're there already with the rebels, because they often do that. They, the government send their troops incognito. Uh, will they go to heaven? No, no. These demoniac wars, all of them go to hell. You don't, you don't get the benefit. If you're fighting for Duryodhana, of course, in this case, Krishna was there. So, uh, that's a benefit. But otherwise, uh, it's not that, that the p people who are fighting in the modern war with no Vedic rules and for no, not for the sake of Dharma, and they don't, they don't go to heaven for doing so. Not at all. They may be heroic, they may be brave, they may have good intentions, but they don't get any pious benefit, what to speak of spiritual benefit, by fighting, fighting some demoniac war for some demoniac army, for some demoniac government which is ruled by demoniac corporations, demoniac way of fighting also. Actually, until fairly recently in history, the, the fighting means it would be between the armies, not that you destroy all the towns and villages and kill all the women and children. 
That was introduced in the American Civil War, destroying the villages. It was introduced by the Americans, actually. Otherwise, that wasn't done. If they, if they, I believe it was the Victorious Party, the Northern Party. They, they, they had access to villages who supported the Confederate troops. They just wipe out the whole village to teach them not to support that cause. Concentration camps were invented by the British. in the Boer War in South Africa. Mm. Then? There's one verse that says whether one has got material desires or yeah. non material desires or, yeah. you know, you're completely self-satisfied. You can all achieve success by worshipping Krishna. By the verse is a karma sarva karma va moksha karma udaridhi hi ti rena bhakti yogena yajeta purushamparam, which is often translated as uh, whether one is uh, desireless, full of desires, or desires liberation, one should worship Krishna. That is an incorrect translation, or it's a partially correct translation. One crucial word has been left out, tivrena, which means with great intensity. So it's not that you go down to the ice cream shop and uh, chant a few rounds in between ice creams and you say, well, you see, you have all desires, so anyway, uh, says in the Bhagavad, but tivrena, with great intensity, which means you don't go down to the ice cream shop. Great intensity, one should worship Krishna. So the idea that we maintain all our material desires and worship Krishna, and it's all the same anyway, this is not supported by the Bhagavatam, and it's not uh, the proper understanding of this verse. It's a, it's a common misquoting of it by the, the people who want to cheat themselves. The people who want... But then, Tivrena, you have to practice very... Uh, Seriously, and the example in Dhruv Maharaj, he had such material desires, but he practiced very seriously. He gave up all sense gratification. He became purified by doing so. But you don't be, if you indulge in material desires and go on with this wishy washy so called Krishna consciousness, then the purification doesn't take place. Yes. It's just a cheating process. You may want to be a hero. Hmm. You may really have a big desire to be a hero. But then you work under the guidance of the spiritual master, he'll make you the real hero. Yeah, yeah, the real hero is one who can control his senses. Srila Prabhupada wrote, greater hero. Another consideration is that to be a relatively minor hero for the right cause, or even to be just a regular worker for the right cause, is much better than being a great hero for the wrong cause. A, a, an assistant in Rama's army is far more glorious than Kumbhakarna or, or Indrajit in Ravana's forces. Who in one sense they were Kumbhakarna, Indrajit, they're very powerful and great heroes. But they, were on the, but they were on the wrong side. So better to be the, the squirrel who was pushing the sand into the sea with the intention to serve Rama. Hare Krishna.